tune we are hearing is a musical setting of a poem by the Reverend George Herbert, written in 1633, The Call. It captures something very real of the gospel reading we'll hear today from Mark. Here's George Herbert's poem. Come, my way, my truth, my life, such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a life as killeth death. Come, my light, my feast, my strength, such a light as shows a feast, such a feast as mends in length, such a strength as makes his guest. Come, my joy, my love, my heart, such a joy as none can move, such a love as none can part, such a heart as joys in love. Let us celebrate our call together. morning. Let's pray together. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Together, echoing the angels, let us give glory to God. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation. 
that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us hear now together God's word to us this Sunday. A reading from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 62, verses 6 through 14. O God, alone my soul in silence waits. Truly my hope is in Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My stronghold so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my safety and my honor. God is my strong rock and my refuge. Put your trust in him always, O oh people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. Those of high degree are but a pleating breath. Even those of low estate cannot be trusted. On the skills they are lighter than a breath. All of them together. Put no trust in extortion, in robbery, take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God has spoken once, twice have I heard it. That power belongs to God. Steadfast his love is yours, O Lord. For you repay everyone according to his deeds. A reading from the book of the prophet Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The Word of the Lord.
reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. The story is told from a couple of generations ago of a man whose world was in an uproar. Around him was war. Some of his loved ones, closer in family and friends, have been drawn into that war. He was beyond that point in his life. His business had fallen on hard times. Something he had worked hard at for decades was failing altogether. There was sickness among his immediate family. He was a man of faith. He took it to prayer. And he asked God to, to help him, to, to, to make it right, to make some of this ease or stop. Things only seemingly got worse. So he took it upon himself eventually to go to his church and to make an appointment to sit and talk about this with his church's minister. He got there, he sat down, poured out his story, and his minister responded with compassion, with understanding. And the gentleman eventually said deep into their conversation, but pastor, I pray and I pray and I pray and I ask God to stop this terrible shaking of my world in so many ways and it just goes on, it just goes on. And the minister sat back in his chair and said this, Henry, let me ask you one question. What if it's God who's doing the shaking? That's quite a thought. The scriptures today speak about God breaking into this world that God first created, but which has been a world disrupted by sin disrupted by the presence of humans, and sometimes we're great and sometimes we're not so great. And the scriptures today talk about God's intervention into the world again, and in continuing fashion, to remake, to recreate the world as God first intended it to be. So when John the Baptist has been arrested, Mark's Gospel tells us, still in the first chapter, Jesus comes... And he begins his ministry. He says, the time is now. And the first thing he does is an echo, a direct echo of John the Baptist preaching. He says to the people, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near you. Repent and believe the good news. Which could be translated more fittingly as, Turn away from whatever direction you've been looking for happiness. Wherever you've been looking for fulfillment, wherever you've been looking for possibility, don't look in that direction anymore. Look in the direction I'll point out to you. And put your trust in the good news that you need to and that you're going to hear. It's a radical change. 
Jesus walks on from there onto the beach and he calls two sets of brothers, all four of them fishermen, to follow him. As he begins his work, Jesus is not going to do it alone. He's going to do it in the company of others. That's a reminder of why we are a community as a church. And he calls them to something radical that as yet they cannot even understand. But somehow, they hear Jesus' call as having authority. He comes to the boat of Simon and Andrew and says, Come, follow me. I'll make your fishers of people. And in one of his favorite words, Mark says, Immediately, they followed him. Jesus goes on with them, we have to suppose now, with the two of them, Simon and Andrew. And down further down the beach are Zebedee, and his sons, James and John, and their hired men in a boat, cleaning their nets after a night of fishing. And Jesus says to John and James, come, follow me. And again, the word is there, immediately they do. There's some kind of authority in his voice. He's asking them, for the moment at least, and they don't know what else, to leave behind everything that they've known, everything that they have, their way of life, their families, all their people, all their hopes that they had held until then, all the responsibilities that might have been theirs. Interestingly, Zebedee, the father of James and John, the name Zebedee means my gift. And his name became real, perhaps more real than at any point in his life in that moment when he made whether he wanted to or not, a gift of his two sons to follow the Christ. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know why. But there's no hesitation in their response. Whether, we don't know whether they understood what he was saying, whether they believed in him, whether they even knew really who he was. But they went. One writer describes it this way. Powerful words, I think. Somehow, they are compelled to follow him, a man whom they cannot understand, on a journey that will perplex and confuse them to a destination as yet unspecified. Wow. That's acting in faith. But what they're asked to do, fundamentally, is to open themselves to see life, to see the world in a brand new way, in a way they never dreamt could have been possible. That's the repent. That's the repent. And that's the trusting in the good news that they expect to hear from Christ. <clears throat> and so they go. St. Paul, in the first letter to the Corinthians today, in just three little verses from chapter 7, extraordinary words. He says, you know, the appointed time is coming. Time as we know it is short. And so he says, those who are married should live as if they're not. Those who own property should live as if they don't. All these, these things saying that as he finally says, for the world as we know it is passing away. Now, it's too easy for us to say, well, well, he thought the world was going to end in some way at that point, in the first generation after Christ. But that was 2,000 years ago. We're still here. Well, what about the possibility, and I don't know, the way human beings, the way we've treated God's creation thus far, what if 100,000 years from now, Humanity is still populating this earth and perhaps other planets as well. Where we stand today, 2,000 years after Christ, will look as if the death, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Christ had literally just happened. It will look, from, from their point of view, 100,000 years from now, as if we were there on Calvary. And so these words, this, this point of view, that St. Paul puts before us is meant for us. 
And it again asks us for what? To see life, to see the world in a radically different way. What is breaking in here? What's breaking in is the way the kingdom, the reign of God. And what can be very uncomfortable to us who get used to the way things are in this world, the way we've ordered them as human beings, is that the kingdom of God and the ways of the world cannot live in one place. And they cannot live comfortably in one human being. It's one or the other. God doesn't come in Christ to fix the world. God comes in Christ to begin the recreation of the world. If you look all the way to the end of Scripture, the book of Revelation, what is there? The world is entirely recreated. The old heavens and the earth are no more. The new heavens and the new earth come to be. Our first lesson today from Jonah shows a moment like that. Jonah, who didn't want to go to Nineveh to speak in God's name, Jonah, who didn't want the people of Nineveh to repent, finally goes, after resisting and finding himself in the belly of a big fish, finally spewed out onto the shore, another beach. Jonah, God says to Jonah again, now will you go to Nineveh? Now will you call Nineveh to repentance? And so Jonah goes. And he goes to this huge city where he doesn't want to be, and people he hates people he hates, people who later on, although they repent here, will destroy the northern kingdom of Israel, Jonah's home. So he goes and he says, 40 days more and Nineveh will be destroyed. Amazingly, after one day of saying this, these pagan people who do not know the God of Israel, who hate Israel, repent put on sackcloth and ashes from the king down to, as it says elsewhere in the book, the farm animals, and repent. The king of Nineveh, the emperor of the Assyrians, somehow had the wherewithal to believe that something different could be true of the world, of the way the world really worked, than he had ever been led to imagine before. He was able in that moment himself and to ask his people, and again, all the way to the domestic animals, let us live as if there is a God in Israel. Let us live as if this proclamation of our destruction is real. Let us live and act as though by our repentance we can change God's mind. And so they did. All of these things, all of them, posed to us in Paul's terms, from Jonah, from Paul himself, from Jesus' first actions in Mark's gospel, posed to us the question, even if you and I are afraid to let go of the structures of this world as we know them, even if we are like old Henry going to his pastor a couple of generations ago and saying, stop the shaking, it's scaring me. The question posed to us today is, can I live, can you live as if God's kingdom has broken into this world? Can we live as if we are being called to live in a kingdom of God fashion. Can I live, can you live, as if the way God wants things to be is more important to me, to you, than anything, any determination that might be made by men or women here on earth? Can we speak as though the love of God lives in our hearts. Can we act? Can we use our energies, our words, our homes, our money, all our resources, as if 
the most important use of any of them is not what the world tells us, but that it is to sustain one another, to reach out to the weakest among us, to allow the way of charity, of love, to be our way. That's the fundamental question the scriptures put before us this Sunday. I want to share with you a poem by the poet Mary Oliver, who lived for decades and decades and went out every day with a notepad and walked up and down the beaches like Jesus did that day on Cape Cod, in her case, and wrote poetry. This is a poem of hers called The Summer Day. And at the end is a question that Mary, I think, is posing in the name of Jesus, in the name of God, to us, to Henry sitting with his pastor long ago, to our children, to our children's children. The Summer Day by Mary Oliver. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean, the one who has flung herself out of the grass, the one who is eating sugar out of my hand, who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Together now, let us profess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With confidence, we pray. Our response will be, for God alone, my soul in silence waits. For a greater love for the word of God, that we may take time to read, ponder, and pray with the scriptures, so that we may deepen our relationship with God and take on the mind and heart of Christ. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For the grace of courage that the Spirit of God will make us confident in sharing God's message, and that our lives will be an invitation to others to encounter God today. 
For God alone, my soul in silence waits. As we celebrate the annual octave of prayer for Christian unity, that God will heal the wounds and misunderstandings of the past, lead all the baptized to offer a more united witness to the gospel and offer greater service to our suffering and vulnerable neighbors. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For all who are ill, particularly for those with the coronavirus, that God will heal the sick, protect the vulnerable from the virus, strengthen healthcare workers, and make the vaccines available and effective. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For all who are alienated or disconnected from God, the Spirit will redirect their hearts to the life and wholeness that is found in a relationship with God. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For a deeper appreciation of life, that the Spirit of God will guide us in supporting women who have difficult pregnancies and welcome them and their children with joy into our community. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For Congress and the new administration, that God will inspire their understanding of current issues and guide them in addressing the economic, health care, and safety issues of our society, For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For healing of our nation, that God will heal the divisiveness and mistrust that divides us and open a new path of dialogue, cooperation, and advancement of the common good. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For our parish, that we may grow into deeper unity and be energized to answer God's call to us. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. For all who have died, that Christ may welcome them to the eternal banquet of God's reign. For God alone, my soul in silence waits. We open our hearts to you, Lord, with confidence and expectant joy. Hear our prayers and answer them as may be best for us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Thank you. And now, friends, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now for those of us who will be unable to come to the church parking lot just after our service and coffee hour today to receive the Lord in the Eucharist, Let us pray with faith the prayer of spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people who long to gather at every altar of your church where the Holy Eucharist has been celebrated, and we pray will be celebrated again soon, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. Since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty Father, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, may your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. For he is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. And now a word of blessing. Our hearts cry out for love. And God pours that gift into us for sharing freely. 
So may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. It's really true, you never know. Thank you for joining us at St. Matthew's Worcester for our prayer and worship of God this Sunday morning. Join us anytime and find out more about us on our website, which is stmatthewsworcester.org. The Church of St. Matthew, Apostle and Evangelist in Worcester, serving the heart of the Commonwealth since 1871.